In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So begins the story of mankind and of God's dealing with man. And in six days he made all that was made in the creation. Let there be life. Let there be a permanent in the midst of the heavens. Let the ground bring forth vegetation. Let there be sun, moon, and stars. Let the seas and the air be filled with life, the birds and the fishes. Let the earth bring forth animals, four-footed beasts and creeping things. And then he said, And let us make man in our image after our likeness. And in the image of God he created man. And on the seventh day he rested. And God planted a garden known as the Garden of Eden. And there he placed man. But it wasn't good for man to be alone. And so he said, I will make a helper meet for him. And he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and took from his side a side piece, a rib. And from it he fashioned woman and brought her to the man. And she said, he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And God told them that of every tree in the garden they were allowed to eat except for one. That was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, you shall not eat of it lest you die. But the serpent beguiled them by saying, God knows that when you eat of that, you will be wise like him, and your eyes will be open. And so the woman took and ate and gave to the man, and he ate. And because of this sin, they were driven from the garden and alienated from that fellowship with God. But God inaugurated a plan of sacrifice, the patriarchal age, we call it, whereby through these means man could once again approach God and find some satisfaction for his sin. And so they left the garden, and they had children, Cain and Abel. And so it was, as you remember, that Cain killed Abel because he was jealous of the fact that Abel's sacrifice was accepted. And Adam had other children, and sons and daughters. And it came about in the course of time that man became extremely wicked. Only the imaginations of their hearts were extremely wicked all the time. And God determined that he would destroy mankind. And so he was to bring a flood upon the earth. But Noah found favor with God, and Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives were told to prepare an ark. And so they did, and in that ark they found safety when the rain began to fall for forty days and forty nights. And so it continued that way. They were in the ark for nearly a year as the waters receded and all the flesh on the earth died. And Noah and his family stepped out and offered sacrifices to God. Things continued to go from bad to worse. People stood together and caused problems together, and God confounded their language where they would go and spread out and fill the earth. And they did, to some degree. And then there was a man that God called in a very special way. He lived in Earl of the Chaldees. His name was Abram. And God said, Get thee up from thy kindred and from thy father's house, and go into a land that I will show thee. And he and Terah and others of his family, like Lot, went up to Haran. And then again God called him, and he went over into the Promised Land. And there Abraham sojourned for the rest of his life. And he had a wife named Sarah. And they had a son named Isaac, the child of promise. And Isaac married Rebekah. And Isaac and Rebekah had Esau and Jacob. And Jacob was God's favorite of the two. And he chose Jacob to be his. He named him Israel. And it was from him that twelve sons were born, the twelve patriarchs, later to be known as the twelve tribes of Israel. By and by, there was a famine in the land, and the people began to be in want. Joseph, in the meantime, had been sold by his brothers, down into Egypt. They did not know that he had already survived what happened in Potiphar's house when he was wrongly accused of attacking his wife. How that he had told the dreams of the uh, butler and the baker and they came true. 
And one day when Pharaoh had some dreams that he didn't understand, he interpreted them as well, representing, he said, seven years of famine, of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. So it was the people up in Israel got hungry. And they came down to Egypt, ten of the brothers. Joseph did not make himself known to them at first. But eventually he did. And eventually they brought the youngest child down, Joseph's only real blood brother, 100%. And that was Benjamin. They had the same mother and father. And then he told them to come down into Egypt and he would take care of them because the famine would last for seven years. And so they all moved down into the land of Egypt. And it was during this period of time that Joseph cared for his family. But after this generation died, there arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. And he began to oppress the children of Israel as they were beginning to multiply in the land of Goshen. And he was afraid that they might join with some enemy and maybe overthrow the government there in Egypt. And so he dealt hard with them in the labor of making of bricks, and the children of Israel cried to the Lord for help out of their misery. And during this terrible time, there was a young boy born to the family, Abraham and Jochebed, whose, little name, whose name was Moses. And it just so happened that uh, they put him in a little ark to keep from killing the child, as Pharaoh had commanded, and Miriam, his sister, watched. And you remember that they brought him out and uh, gave him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he was brought up in Pharaoh's house. He then had to flee Egypt because he had killed an Egyptian who was oppressing a Hebrew. And for forty years he stayed in the land of Midian with Jethro, Married his daughter, Sephora. At the age of eighty, at the burning bush, the Lord appeared to him again, and he said, Go into Egypt and command to Pharaoh, Let my people go. Moses did not want to do that, but God gave him the power and the miracles that he could perform, and so he went. And so with a mighty hand, God led them out of Egypt, and they came to the edge of the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army right behind them. And they said, were there no graves in Egypt that you brought us here to die? And then he waved his wand, the rod, and the waters parted. And the children of Israel marched over on dry land. And when Pharaoh and his army went in, the waters began to return, and the Egyptians were drowned. And Israel was delivered from the Egyptians and found themselves in the wilderness of Sinai. They went a good little ways down to the tip of Sinai to a great mountain called Mount Sinai. It was during this time that uh, they were fed the manna, and they were given water to drink out of the rock God cared for them. And there on Mount Sinai they gathered around that mountain, and God came down on that mountain, and the children were told not to draw nearer, not to touch it. And they heard the voice of God, I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And then all of the other laws were given to them about the tabernacle and the priesthood. And God showed them that this was the way that they could approach him. And so they, he gave unto them this ministry and this legislation we know as the Mosaic legislation. They come up ready to go into the promised land. And they send the spies out from Kadesh Barnea, so excited about it. But the spies come back. And they say it is a good land, but their cities have walls that reach to heaven, and there are giants in the land, and we were as grasshoppers on our own side, and so were we in there. And they believed the word of the ten spies. Caleb and Joshua said, we're well able to take it. The Lord has removed their defenses. But they didn't listen to them. And because of this, they wandered forty years in the wilderness, until that whole generation would die off. 
Joshua would lead them into the promised land and not know it. And they went all the way around to the eastern side of the Jordan River. They did not go straight in. They went all the way around, looping around the Dead Sea, on up through the wilderness to the Jordan. And there on Mount Nebo, Moses stood, and he looked over and saw the promised land. And God showed it all to him, and he said, This is the land. You shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. After the death of Moses, Joshua took over the leadership, and the children of Israel crossed the Jordan over on dry ground. And the children of Israel reached the first objective, Jericho, and marched around the city as God instructed, and Jericho fell. And the children of Israel drove right through the land and cut the northern part from the southern part. And then they defeated the northern groups of people that were there, and then the southern groups of the people that were there, and had the land to be theirs, and divided it among the twelve tribes, and set up a place for the tabernacle to be worshipped to worship God at Shalom. And for a period of time, they were ruled by men and women known as judges. Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon. Many of you have heard of all of these. You know them well. And the difference, the enemies that they would fight. Israel would sin and they would go into trouble. And the Lord again sent a deliverer to them. The last of the judges was probably Samuel. And the children of Israel were tired of being governed by judges, and they wanted a king to be like all the nations around them. And this was displeasing to Samuel and displeasing to God, but God said, if this is what they have to have, then give it to them. But we warned them what it would be like for them to have a king. And so it was a young man, taller than nearly anyone else, a good-looking, striking young man by the name of Saul, the son of Kish, was presented to them as their king. And for forty years he reigned. At first he seemed to do quite well, but he didn't do well after that. There was a young man in his court by the name of David, who was an experienced singer and harp player, and also quite a warrior, the one that killed Goliath. And Saul was jealous of him. And he thought the people liked him better than they did Saul. And so all of this bitter envy and jealousy led to his downfall and his run when he was slain on the battlefield fighting against the Philistines. And at the death of Saul, all the tribes came to David and asked him to be their king. Israel reached the height of its power, I would say, in the days of David. Maybe the height of its glory in the days of Solomon. But it was David who defeated the enemies and paved the way for his son. But even David was not perfect, as his sin with another man's wife, Bathsheba, showed. And his sin in numbering the people instead of trusting in God. But he was still said to be a man after God's own heart. And most of the beautiful psalms that we read and enjoy were written by him. Many of them were not, but many of them were the sweet singer of Israel. David died about 1010 B.C., and he was succeeded by his son Solomon, who inherited all of this and built on it and became fabulously wealthy, unbelievably wealthy, and had 700 wives and 300 concubines, a thousand wives, you might say. And his glory and splendor was known all over the world. But many of these wives were not believers in God. They were pagan. And he began to go after the gods of these wives. And they turned his heart away from God. And his heart was not perfect with God, as was his father David. And Nathan the prophet came to him and told him that because of this, the kingdom would be taken away from him. Two tribes would be left for them, but the ten tribes would go elsewhere. And so when Solomon died, the kingdom split. Rehoboam, his son, ended up with Judah and Benjamin and many of the Levites. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, took the ten tribes. The southern tribes came to be known as Judah. This was in 930 B.C. The northern tribes came to be known as Israel. The northern tribes continued for 
close to 200 years. There were very few good kings up there and very little good that was done. A golden calf had been set up at Dan and another one at Bethel. And Jeroboam, their king, said, These are your gods. Serve these. And so many of them did that. There were good kings and bad kings down south. Jerusalem was still the center, the temple was still there, and the priesthood, to some degree, was still fallen. And so it was we come down through the different lines of the kings. The northern kingdom down to about 722 B.C. In 722 B.C., the Assyrian army, from way over near the Tigris River, marched across there, there was Shalmaneser V, and then there was Sennacherib, and with this huge horde destroyed the northern kingdom and carried them off into Assyrian captivity. And they never did come back and establish that kingdom again. Probably many of them did. Uh, their descendants came back probably when the others came back in 536. But they never were known as a kingdom up there again. The southern kingdom lasted for some time. There were good kings and bad kings, as I said. One of the most notable of the good kings was Hezekiah. He was a good man. And he was living in the days of the Assyrian invasion. And he prayed to God to deliver the southern kingdom from the Assyrians. And God did. There were 185,000 men of Sennacherib who were slain in one night. And Aqueb arose and took his army back home. They never did threaten the southern kingdom again. The southern kingdom continued on down until the days of the Babylonians in the 600s. And then, of course, near the end of the southern kingdom, it seemed that nearly all of the kings were bad. There was Josiah, who repaired the temple and did many good things. And then in the last run of kings, it seemed like one bad one after the other. The days of the northern kingdom were the days of Hosea and Amos. They preached to the north to get them to come back to God. Hosea was the prophet of God's love, and Amos the prophet of justice. God demands that you treat everybody right. But they didn't listen to these prophets as they should have. Those were the days of Jonah. But he was told to go to Nineveh and preach, though he didn't want to, and had an unexpected trip to the whale. But you know the story after that. He went to Jonah, he went to Nineveh, and he did preach just like he was asked to do. These were the preachers in the northern kingdom. In the southern kingdom in the 8th century were Isaiah and Micah. And Isaiah known as the Messianic prophet more than any other. And probably writes in the most beautiful literature of all of them, lived about 700 B.C. And he was an advisor to King Hezekiah and to the other kings along that time. As he helped them to show them what God would have them do and what God's will was for his people. He was a great influence who left us a great legacy. Micah, while Isaiah was mainly in the courts in Jerusalem, there was another prophet, his name was Micah, who lived and preached at the same time in the southern kingdom, out in the villages, out in the farming communities, telling them essentially the same message that Isaiah was telling those in the city. When we come down to the 600s and then the early 6th century, we have another group of prophets. For most of these would probably be Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Jeremiah knew that the south was doomed and there wasn't much way it was going to get any better. And he called the people to repentance as a last effort, last ditch effort. But they wouldn't listen to him. And they beat him and they put him in the stocks and mistreated him in every way. He finally ended up fleeing for his life to go down into Egypt. And many think that he died there in the land of Egypt. A very unhappy man. A great man of God who dared to go against the grain and speak to the people those words that eventually made his life so miserable. But I really think that those people knew he was telling them the truth. 
Along with him was Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, however, in 597 B.C., had been carried off to Babylon. And so he was over in Babylon preaching to the Jews who had already been deported there about the same time Jeremiah was preaching there in Jerusalem. Ezekiel seemed to take his work a, a little better than Jeremiah and didn't have the agony and the misery that the other had, but his message was essentially the same, that Jerusalem was to be destroyed because of their sin. There was another prophet who worked side by side to Jeremiah, though he never mentions him, and that's Zephaniah. Zephaniah lived in the days of the Babylonian threat there in Jerusalem, speaking the same message. Over with Ezekiel, carried off in 606 B.C., were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a number of other choice men, and women as well. And it was Daniel who interpreted the dreams for Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. And it was Daniel who continued there until the days of Cyrus. As an advisor to the kings, they realized the Spirit of God was in him, that he had the power uh, to prophesy and to predict what would happen and could give them advice. And it was Daniel who was called in when Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall at 539 B.C. Mene, Mene, Tekel, you forcing. And they called Daniel in to interpret it. And Mene, Mene, your days are numbered and brought to an end. Tekel, you have weighed in the balances and found warning. You parson, your kingdom is divided and given into the hands of the Medes and the Persians. And that night, Babylon fell. Belshazzar was slain. Daniel's words came true. And Cyrus, king of Persia, took it over. It wasn't long after Cyrus took over that he told the Jews, as well as all of the other people who had been deported by the Babylonians, go home. Go home to your people. Go home to your home, to your land, and build homes, and, and build temples to your God. And on one of his monuments he, we have written, and he said, and pray for me, and pray for me. This was a happy time, not only for the Jews, but for many others. Some chose not to go, but others did. And those that went home in the first big wave were led by a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And there was a high priest named Joshua who went with them. And they came back to Palestine and laid the foundation of the temple and started to rebuild the temple there in Jerusalem, but were stopped. And it was Haggai and Zechariah that stood up and said, Let's get this building finished. Is it all right for you to dwell in sealed houses while the house of God lies waste? Arise, go to the forest and bring the timber and let us build the house of the Lord. And it was under their preaching about 520 B.C. that they got back to work on the temple. And in 516 B.C. the temple was finished exactly 70 years after it was destroyed, 586. And so it was the work of these men that encouraged them to go ahead with their job. There was another one that came back in 444 B.C., and then another one about 457 B.C., Nehemiah and Ezra. And Ezra came back with a company of priests and restored the worship. And Nehemiah came back, and he had the wherewith to rebuild the walls. He was subsidized by the Persian kings at that time, who happened to be Artaxerxes. And so he came back, and the walls to the city were built. And the temple had been rebuilt, and the worship had been restored, and the Jews were home again, and had been blessed by God as God had promised, and as the prophets had foretold. Nahum lived shortly about that time, around the 600s, and the prophet Nahum was directed against Nineveh. Nineveh is going to fall, and nobody, he says, will cry at your funeral. That's not exactly the way he said it, but that's what he meant. But who will weep over you, he says. And in 612 B.C., Nineveh fell. That was the end of the Assyrian threat forever. Babylon was gone, and now it's Persia. There was one family, a man named Mordecai, who chose not to go home. Being a good Jew, he raised his cousin Esther 
and took care of her since it seemed that she was an orphan. And you may remember that she was chosen to be the king's wife when there was a vacancy there when Vashti had been deposed. And you may also remember that there was Haman who was getting ready to do all he could to destroy the Jews. And Mordecai told Esther this was her time in life. He said, And who knows but what you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Maybe this is why you got that job. And so she said, Well, I will go. And if I perish, I perish. Of course, the king, her husband, listened to her, and he gave a counter-edict to save the lives of the Jews, and he thoroughly destroyed those enemies who had planned that wickedness against them. These were the days of the exile. These were the days after the exile, when they came home, and God's people were there in their land once more. The story of the Old Testament ends about a hundred years later with the message of Malachi. Malachi was living during a day when the humdrum of priesthood was already becoming less than spectacular. And they were offering lame and animals and crippled animals and sick animals to God and saving back the best for themselves. And one of his incisive comments, questions was, will a man rob God? Malachi ends his book with the prophecy of the coming of Elijah. And Elijah is not, of course, the prophet Elijah of the 800s. But this is John the Baptist who will come to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the children to their fathers, to look forward to a time when the Messiah would be here upon this earth. And thus we have seen from Genesis to Malachi the one big thread that God loves us and that God will care for us. And the one thing that He wants from all of us is to give our lives to Him. That's the bottom line. Perhaps there's someone here tonight who would like to do that. If so, come as we stand to see.